Hello and welcome to New Mandala TV. I'm Ross Tapsell from the School of Culture, History and Language here at the Australian National University. I'm here with two professors of Indonesian Studies um, from the ANU College of Asia and Pacific, Professor Ed Aspinall and Professor Ariel Harianto. Thanks for joining us. We're going to talk about uh, the Indonesian election and a bit of a wrap up and discussion about some of the issues from that. Um, let me start with you, Ed, um, because I'd like to ask, what, is, what does this election mean for Indonesia? But you've, obviously, uh, you've often talked about this being as a continuation of reformasi. Is that your view? Well, this really came home to me most of all actually on the day of the election itself, on the, the evening after the, fir after the quick counts were announced, um, that I went down with some friends to the main roundabout in the centre of uh, Jakarta and met there the, with the people who were celebrating uh, Jokowi's uh, victory. So I, I met there with a lot of people I'd known from 15, 16, 20 years ago when I'd been conducting research on the opposition movement to the, to the Suharto regime. So it was obvious that for many of them, for many of the pro-democracy activists of that earlier generation, that was exactly how they saw this election. That this uh, kind of broad coalition which had assembled 16 years ago to bring down the Suharto regime, in many important respects, with some exceptions, sort of reassembled uh, behind Joko Widodo this year. And I think that's partly, um, it's partly because of uh, Jokowi and who he represents, but it's largely, I think, uh, because of uh, Prabowo and who he was seen as, uh, and that he was seen as representing a kind of re reversal in the direction of new order style politics. Mm. Okay, Ariel, do you <coughs> see it as a continuation of reformasi? In a way, yes, I would agree with that. Even though we must also add that that sort of desire for liberty, for civil life was already there, you know, before and soon after the Independence Day then get interrupted. So it's always that sort of pendulum that swings back and forth from time to time. <coughs> yes, uh, the, the, the only difference I'd say, a quite remarkable difference though, I think, is that with the reformasi movement of the 1998, it's too, I would say, masculinist. It's a lot of force and violence involved. With this one, it's rather different, I'd say. Uh, if it's not too feminist, at least there's a lot of soft power being deployed and quite successfully, I'd say. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Ed, you've been quite articles with Marcus Mietzner in New Mandala, arguing that Prabowo was a threat to democracy, and indeed one was entitled Vote for Me, uh, but only once when talking about Prabowo. Um, were you specifically lobbying for Jokowi in this election? Was that your intention? I don't know if you would quite uh, put it that way, but it's certainly the case that uh, I was hoping, and I'm sure I can speak on behalf of uh, Marcus uh, in this case as well, that I was certainly hoping uh, that Jokowi would win. Um, you know, I'm a scholar of, uh, of politics. Uh, a lot of my research down the year has been, uh, down the years has been on issues to do with democratization and democracy. And of course, uh, I saw uh, in the uh, Prabowo presidency, for all the reasons uh, that we outlined in uh, quite a few of those of writings in New Mandala and elsewhere, that the Prabowo presidential campaign represented a serious threat to the democratic system had, that had, um, evo that's evolved in Indonesia since those reformasi years. So of course in, in writing about the presidential elections it's very natural uh, that we would try and highlight uh, some of those dangers, in particular because uh, we saw that um, uh, that aspect of the Prabowo presidential campaign, it seemed to us, especially early on, uh, wasn't really being noticed by a lot of the international media coverage. Um, that and domestic media too? Yeah, I think, it's, I think it's fair to say, and partly I think it's because uh, the Jokowi uh, campaign also yeah. didn't highlight right. that a aspect of the, of the Prabowo campaign. Um, so th for, for us, I mean, it seemed very obvious that many of the things that Prabowo was saying that in carried an implicit threat of an authoritarian reversal weren't being highlighted and understood <coughs> that way uh, in a lot of the media discussion. So that's why we wrote uh, some of those pieces. Mm. Ari, what did you th make of Ed and Marcus's pieces? Great, uh, great, Prabowo. fantastic, yes. And I'm particularly happy with the responses that they received. Um, but I was always already um, worried that somebody like Prabowo could have been nominated, nominated at all. Mm. So it 
I think the point that、uh, that Ed and Marcus raised is only a part of a larger worries for me. Okay. So if Indonesians were not quick, I think the response is partly because of that. They are quite overwhelmed with in, with the number of and the amount and the scale of impunity that the previous、um, criminals、um, could get away with already in the past. Okay. In contrast, though, you have written about challenging authoritarianism in Indonesia before, but in, for this election, you've chosen not to to write along the lines of, of Ed and Marcus.、Um, why has your approach been been different to theirs of, of worrying about? I think one of the articles was "Don't be fooled, Prabowo still doesn't want democracy." What? Why have you had a different approach to, to Ed and Marcus? I'm sorry, I, I'm not sure. What do you mean by difference? Here, well, these guys have been writing for New Mandala、yes. consistently about、yes. the threat of Prabowo, yes, yes. and in your case, you haven't written much about. That's right.、Actions. That's right. Well, for one reason, <clears throat> before 1998, I was very excited to write a lot about things that were not allowed to be written by Indonesians. I was in Indonesia back then,、hmm. so there's a lot of desire. But since then, the space was quite wide and open. And a lot of people have written much better than I did, so I feel really, you know,、uh, not best qualified to write the things. I enjoy what others have written, so I have not written much about about the election, as you said. Yes, you're right. Okay.、Um, you, you've, I've quoted that. Don't be fooled. Prabowo still、um, still doesn't want democracy. Do you think a lot of Indonesians weren't aware of this intention, and then now seeing Prabowo's response to? Uh, losing the election, that then a lot are now realizing、uh, Prabowo's undemocratic tendencies. I mean, the, the idea that "Don't be fooled" suggests a lot of people didn't realize. Is that what you think? Well, I mean, we chose that title in in response to a particular press statement or a press conference that Prabowo <coughs>、um, uh, was in, in, involved with. Um, where he was talking about、uh, direct elections, and、okay. he did what he often does, which is、uh, claim to be a democrat, and yet、uh, make various comments that hinted very strongly that in this particular case he wanted to do away with direct elections. And it seemed to us that from some of the feedback we got from people who were participants in that press conference,、yep. that they took on board the "Yes, I'm a democrat" part of it, but didn't fully. Uh, get the implications、yeah. of some of the other things he he was saying. So、okay. that's what we wanted to highlight in that particular case.、Yeah. Now, as for the more general、um, uh, popular uh, response to Prabowo and the support for him, I think this is one of the interesting things we're going to have to look into in a lot more detail over coming months. Now that the the excitement of the campaign itself has passed, you know what was the nature. Of uh, Prabowo's uh, support base,、yep. my colleague、uh, Marcus Mietzner thinks that there's a sort of a hard core of support for Prabowo,、mm. maybe something like fifteen, seventeen, twenty percent, who accepted the full program and understood Prabowo to be an anti-democratic figure and liked that, you know, and supported、uh, him completely. Whereas there was another,、uh, a much a, a bigger group,、uh, which sort of built up. Uh, during the election campaign, who coalesced around him, supported him, but who supported him for other sorts of reasons.、Mm. They didn't think Jokowi、mm. was really a presidential figure, for example.、Mm. They thought that Prabowo presented himself better、mm. um, as a more educated and uh, fluent, uh, capable、mm. uh, leader, or they liked the nationalism,、uh, mm. or, or whatever <coughs> it might be. Uh, Ariel, why do you think forty-seven percent of Indonesians voted for Prabowo? That, that really remains a mystery to me. But if I may just continue、um, what I just said, and if I am allowed a little bit to be、uh, to play devil advocate here,、um, <clears throat> I would say that Prabowo was just being very honest when he said that he didn't want democracy, but then need to defend himself when being a question. I would say,、um, and quite specul- speculatively,、uh, I must admit, I think most powers that be, if given the opportunity. Would rather not have democracy. It's just too costly. It's just too difficult for them.、Mm. Uh, in other words, everybody would prefer to be a king if they can. I'd say,、uh, <laughs> but not people are allowed、uh, allowed to do that. We don't allow them to do that. So in that case, I think Prabowo is just being honest.、Uh, I remember the time when Soeharto was in power. There was no possibility for anybody else to challenge him, and yet he held the elections every five years. It's a very costly, almost from his point of view, unnecessary rituals, because everybody knew 
uh, who is going to be the winner. Mm. So in that sense, you know, um, democracy is a good thing. But I think if you are in a position of power, I think you'd rather have it as least costly as possible. Mm. Okay. Um, in your piece in the conversation, which you, you wrote just a couple of weeks ago after the election, uh, you said most international commentators have overlooked or underestimated the critical force behind Indonesia's historic moment, and that's individual citizens. In contrast to the flow of familiar money politics, individual citizens proudly publish bank slips on social media, showing off their tiny share of donations to Jokowi's election campaign. Um, so what what... What is the, the, the key message you, you, uh, when you're talking about international commentators missing? What, what's the key message? There? I think overall, I would, I would like to make it even a broader statement uh, to that effect by saying that most of us, I think, prefer to study, we meaning scholars and outside Indonesia, prefer to study people at the very top layers of the society hierarchy or at the very bottom. Um, those who are dictators, those who are corrupt, those are brutal, you know, for kind of reasons, moral or otherwise, uh, because it's an easy target. And we have sympathy for those who are the victims of those people. Mm -hmm. More difficult is people in the middle. If you look at all kinds of study, even, even among scholars of Indonesia, I think there's not enough has been done to really look at the dynamics of the middle classes. Mm. There's so much written already on Suharto, on SBY, Prabowo, Jokowi. Uh -huh. And you're and counting yourself in this, in this crowd? No, it? no, precisely not. Because, maybe because it has something with, with, with my personal life, because I came from a, a place away from Jakarta. I don't know anybody who's well connected to the elite, <laughs> but neither am I the most disadvantaged uh, and the, the worst victims of the system. I'm somewhere in between, and there are millions of people like me, and I felt, you know, we need a place there somehow. Okay. Not to say that I understand what, what, the we there. <laughs> yeah. Do you want to say anything about the money politics aspect of, of this comment? Well, I mean, I would, I would agree with Ariel that this, I mean, this election has been interesting for many, many reasons. But one of them is precisely this issue of where the, you know, the nature of the middle class, the different groupings within the middle class. Did you underestimate the individual civilians in, in this, this stuff about Prabowo, you know, the, don't be fooled of Prabowo and these kind of things? Well, I mean, one thing we did see, and this links it to your question about the money politics, yep. is one thing that we did see when we uh, visited um, campaign centres of the two camps, when we went to various middle-sized towns and so on in Java and elsewhere, was that the Prabowo campaign was extremely well-funded, that this was a mm. classically um, money politics standard uh, Indonesian-style campaign to that, to that extent. Oligarchic funding at the centre, greased by money uh, in, the re in the regions, and a lot of money was being uh, distributed to build these networks and to encourage people to come to meetings and so on. But on the other hand, you had the Joko Jokowi campaign, which to us looked, um, and this is why we were worried, because it's, it was voluntaristic, uh, poorly funded, often rather kind of ramshackle and very sort of amateurish, really, in the way it was being organised in a lot of these places. And when you put the two campaigns next to one another, it just seemed that the, the Prabowo side was so much better organised, better funded, right. and on an upwards trajectory. Uh, so that was where we, so perhaps we did underestimate. Mm. I mean, all's well that ends well, I guess. Yeah. So mm -hmm. uh, in that in okay. that degree, in the, mm. the voluntaristic That's characteristic enough, yes. of the campaign sure. uh, mm. pushed Jokowi into the lead in the end. Mm. All right, let's conclude. Um, Ed, you've said that in many ways Jokowi has already performed perhaps the greatest service he will ever perform for his country, and that's preventing Prabowo from becoming president. So is that how you're going to frame Jokowi's presidency from, from now on? How, how do you think we'll see a Jokowi presidency from here? Well, I mean, that's, I mean, a lot will happen, of course. So, yeah. I mean, but I think that's something that in the future when the inevitable disappointments come and people uh, have, have these very high hopes, sure. they see him as a great reforming figure and yet we already know of course that his campaign too is not completely divorced from the power of money and oligarchic interests. He has um, uh, former generals with bad backgrounds and human rights yep. abuses yep. themselves yep. on his team. When all of those 
pr um, disappointments mm. seep into our evaluations of the Joko Widodo presidency, I think we shouldn't forget that he did he did mm. perform a great service and mm -hmm. he did prevent a real. Uh, to borrow Ariel's term before that pendulum swing mm. right back towards the new order. Indeed. Indeed. Final comment? I would say I would give more credits not to Jokowi, but those who make him president. I think from day one, when he was hesitant, it was other people, the nameless masses, mainly middle class, who keep pressing him quite impatiently that he should run for president and make him so. Mm. So my thanks are to them, really, more than to Jokowi, actually. Okay, thanks everyone for watching. Thanks to Ed and Ariel for coming thanks. in. And New Mandala, of course, is, is, is been a great success for us here at the ANU during this election. And feel free to click on all the articles and sign up and comment. Thanks very much.